Okay, uh, so I wrote down again here the, the main theorem, so the Riemann hypothesis, in the way I phrased it yesterday. And here I recall the four examples I had written, uh, and I wrote down with the normalization the way I define clue sum and sums, this is indeed the right value. Okay, uh, so, uh, so I want to do as, as a first step now is to try and uh, give another example of trying to apply this as a, really as a pure black box and see where we get into a little bit of difficulties and then introduce further invariants which will solve these difficulties. Before I do this, I want to make uh, one or two more comments on this condition of geometric reducibility which necessarily comes into, the, uh, uh, into this theorem. So first, uh, what happens among the examples? So, so examples one are always geometrically reducible. So this I mentioned yesterday because the underlying vector space has dimension one and uh, one dimensional representation is always irreducible. Uh, two, one can show is, is geometrically reducible. Uh, this follows either from the construction or by the Diophantin criterion, which I will state as uh, the second part of this remark. Uh, example three is never geometrically reducible except if f has degree one. So f here is a polynomial with, which is non-constant, so at least one. So three is never geometrically reducible if uh, the degree of f is at least two. Uh, simply because there's always the kind of the average value of this representation number is always one. Uh, and that corresponds to the fact that there is a, a trivial component which one can take off. And so k of n minus one, so when it's defined in this way, is also a trace function and is very often geometrically reducible. So if you remember, the simplest example was when the polynomial is x squared, then uh, k of n minus 1 is just the Legendre symbol n mod p, uh, and this is of an example of case 1, so it's geometrically reducible. Uh, I should say maybe in that case, the dimension of the underlying v uh, for k is the degree of the polynomial. Okay, and case four is like most families at least of elliptic curves, uh, it is geometrically reducible. Okay, so that was our example. Going through the examples and uh, trying to see which ones are geometrically reducible. So you can try to apply this theorem then to many exponential sums we just on these examples, you already get many statements, uh, most of which you would not be able to prove directly without applying uh, the Riemann hypothesis. So this code cancellation, if you take, let's say, uh, a clue sum and sum times uh, example four, conjugate, this is not something you can hope to prove uh, directly. Okay, so a second remark is, uh, what is the meaning? So there is often a very convenient Diophantin interpretation of geometric irreducibility that can be used at least to guess that things are geometrically irreducible. Uh, quite often actually can be used to prove it. So it's also a consequence of the Riemann hypothesis and it was, I guess, first stated explicitly by Katz and it states the following. So I'm going to state it formally as a proposition in a way which is convenient for analytic number series. So there's a more general version which is more convenient for certain more algebraic questions. So assume 
we have for every prime p a trace function kp with complexity uniformly bounded as p varies. So in analytic number theory, this is often the situation. So for every prime p, there's a different trace function, and the complexity on the other end does not grow with p. Then uh, if, so one can phrase this as an if and only if. For the application I want to point out, it's more interesting in the direction of proving geometric reducibility from something. So I'll just take the if component. So if, if you compute the L2 norm of kp over fp, and if this is equivalent to p when p goes to infinity. So this is something you might hope in a number of cases to compute analytically. And if you have an asymptotic formula that begins with p, so intuitively this means that on average these things are uh, one, so because uh, they are bounded and the size of the sum is p. then kp is geometrically reducible for p large enough. And one can be more precise, but I think this gives a rough indication, and in many uh, analytic applications, this is only enough to guess at least that something is geometrically reducible. Uh, you might not be able to get the asymptotic formula, but you might have good heuristics to guess that the leading term is p. Yeah. So, so you can uh, weaken this to being bigger by p to the one half plus delta. Yes. Is there an example where it has been used? I think uh, uh, something yes. is said in German arithmetic, but it's for the yes, that's that's a good remark. So let me first address the remark and then come to my examples. So what uh, Philip says is that. So something I have not said, but the underlying proof of this gives more information. And one component of this information is that, uh, so if one can show, so if you can find some exponent delta positive independent of p such that this L2 norm is uh, at least p to the 1 half plus delta squared. Uh, then, in fact, it will have to be at least of size p. It won't tell you that it's equivalent to p because it could be more than one, but at least you would get that. Then one gets uh, for free uh, that the sum is at least p uh, with these conditions. So uh, I'm still working under this assumption that the complexity is bounded. So this forms, follows from the underlying type of results of Deline, which actually are specialized to state this theorem. Uh, and this, I think, so the one case I know where this is used is uh, there's a paper of uh, Bombieri and Bourguin. So a paper on applications to a problem of harmonic analysis, uh, Kahn's ultra-flat polynomials. Uh, so it's not really necessary because they first give a proof by cats of the estimate they need, and then they reprove the same estimate kind of more uh, directly by using the fact that if you get a tiny uh, compensation, then you get at least square root of p. So it's more in the opposite direction, but uh, so here I could actually say, so if you can, this process goes both ways. So if you can bound, uh, well, I guess then it would not be the L2 now. So. Let me not try to give the two. So, but the principle of this discrepancy, this fact that the exponents tend to jump between one half and one with no gap, uh, is found in this paper of Bourguin. Is used in this paper of Bombieri and Bourguin. Is there an inequality between the complexity and the dimension of the underlying V? Yes. So I think I said that yesterday. Uh, so the complexity is, is among other things. So we, I stated that it's at least the L infinity norm, but in fact, it's also at least the dimension of v. So if I write rho. So by the end of this lecture, we'll have almost all the components of the actual definition of complexity. Uh, and then on next week, I will 
uh, have to introduce the last one, uh, which is necessary to handle certain cases. Okay. Okay, so as an application, uh, I think that you can now, uh, so you can certainly now check irreducibility, so geometric irreducibility of examples. Well, one we already said, but if you didn't know that there's an underlying vector space, so the nice thing about this criterion is that in some sense, you don't need to know that there's an underlying vector space. It's just a purely Diophantine statement. You might be able to verify it without knowing anything about any underlying algebra. So you regain case one if f is a fixed polynomial or a fixed rational function defined over q, because then the modulus is one except at boundedly many points where it's zero. So this is only true. Uh, you can check easily case two. So it's for r equal to two, uh, the modulus square of Clouston ensemble is very easy. Actually, it's a Fourier transform, so it's a Planchel formula. Uh, for R at least three, it's a slightly more complicated computation, but it's still elementary. So, and you get that it's equivalent to P. Uh, for case three, you can do certain cases at least. So, because I didn't state an if and only if, this would not allow you to deduce that it's not geometrically irreducible, but that's not the most interesting application. And for case four, uh, I guess it would work. Though let me say it's an exercise I didn't verify whether the mean square of the number of points on the Legend family is actually easy to compute. I would guess that it is, should be of the same complexity as uh, Clouston and sums. Okay. Okay, so now we have uh, maybe, so we have a black box. Uh, at least some of the terms in the black box we can interpret very concretely, even if we don't care at all about the algebraic geometry. So geometric irreducibility, you can replace to some extent by this criterion. And geometric isomorphism, you can just try and replace it by proportionality of trace functions. So let's try with this to uh, prove an important exponential sum estimate and see whether there are difficulties. So this example comes from the work of Friedlander and Ivaniet. So in studying uh, the ternary divisor function in arithmetic progressions to large moduli, as explained by Terry Tao last week, or early this week, I guess. So they found that in the end, everything could be reduced to a good estimate for the following uh, exponential sums. I will call it fi. Uh, it depends, well, actually the way they write it is a bit different. I will write it uh, with uh, two parameters A and B. So A is non-zero mod P and B is anything in FP. Okay, so it's not actually exactly the way they state it, but that's the way it comes up in the proof. So that's the natural way of writing it. That's the way that Terry wrote it last time. So uh, KL3 of X, so a variable custom and sum with three variables or two variables. Then uh, uh, multiplicatively shifted one, KL3 of AX, P. And then because they have to use uh, completion techniques to sum of bound, I mean, shorter intervals, you need an additive character, so EP of BX. Okay, so uh, estimating this sum was the crucial step for them, and they basically need uh, square root cancellation. So the way they actually write it down, or one way to write it down is as uh, expanding the two clues and sum. So if one does that, which is not actually the best way to think about it. The, the, their initial sum was the expanded one. So they, it was not grouped. Well, I mean, really? I mean, it seems hard for me to get but yeah. Yeah, in their papers, they expanded. Okay. Well, I mean, they expand, but they expand after. They never write it this way. That's true, yeah. yeah. But anyway. So I think, so this is only appearant, uh, appearing in the paper of East Brown. So he, he, he writes this explicitly. Uh, okay, so if one expands uh, the, ex the Clouston ensemble, the hyper Clouston ensemble, 
naively, this is a five variable additive character sum. And the bound they need is code cancellation. So if you write it as a five variable character sum and if you just shifted a little tiny bit the coefficients in a random way, then you would get a genuinely irreducibly five variable character sums and basically you would be, uh, in most cases, rather stuck even now. Uh, so at that time, this was a little bit before the IDs behind such very general versions were completely available in the literature. Uh, so the proof was of the necessary estimate was given by Birch and Bombieri in an appendix to the paper of Friedlander and Ivaniet. So they proved this required code cancellation. So in the cases where it makes sense, so what are the obvious obstructions? So the only completely obvious naive problem that can occur, sorry, I forgot the complex conjugate, is when a is equal to one, then there's a square here, and b is equal to zero. In that, in that case, it's really the modulus square of a KL3, and that cannot be, uh, there cannot be cancellation. So if A is different from 1, or B is non-zero, so A equal to 1 is permitted if B is non-zero, then uh, you have a uniform scout cancellation estimate uh, for all P all primes and all A and B. So uniform in terms of A and B and P. So why uh, do I say it's a cancellation? Remember the KL3s have been normalized by dividing by P, because R is equal to 3. So the fact that these are bounded in L infinity norm already tells you that the KL3 is bounded by P, which is already scored cancellation, actually by P to the 3 half, sorry. Um, so it's already scored cancellation there. It's encoded in the KL3. And so what we want is code cancellation in this sum of bounded terms. But when you expand everything into a five variable sum, this would be for this five variable additive character sum, P to the five half. So this is equivalent to P to the five half for the five variable sum. So full code cancellation. And I think. I don't remember exactly how, how much they can lose about that in the argument, a little tiny bit, but not very much. So you really need, suddenly uh, P squared would not work if only because this would be the trivial bound from this side. So P here, which corresponds to P squared, would be a trivial bound. So let's try and uh, give a proof of this using what we know and see whether there's a problem. OK, so we want to write this as uh, k1 times k2. So you can define uh, k1 of x, for instance, to be kl3 xp. k2 of x is kl3 uh, axp, ep of minus bx, so that the conjugate is the second term. So this one is a trace function. So the second one, it's part of a relatively easy part of the formalism, which I will state in more general versions later, that this is also a trace function. It's not very difficult to prove. And in both cases, the complexity is uniformly bounded with P and with A and with B. OK, basically, because here we're taking the product of two trace functions, and each of them has bounded complexity as P varies uh, either by things I already stated or by easy uh, formalism that I will state later. Okay. How hard is it to get Oh, for the complexity? Yes. Oh, it's very easy. But I mean, it's, to some extent, so this complexity you have to think of as a naive height. So it would be, if you think of actually stock, it would be like the more naive versions of the actual R that occurs in the exact formula. So for analytic purposes, for bounds, it's enough to have a rough uh, quantity. But when you want to do really algebraic things, you might want to have a, a definition that's more, uh, more precise. But here, it doesn't really matter. OK. 
Okay, so uh, so K1 is geometrically reducible. This is fine. We just checked it, and uh, by using the Diophantine criterion, it can really be checked without knowing anything. Uh, K2 also, we're just multiplying with something of modulus one, so it doesn't change the geometry, the Diophantine criterion. And uh, x goes to a x is a bijection on FP, so it also doesn't change anything. So now the question is uh, whether they are geometrically isomorphic or not. So if k1 or the underlying rho1 and rho2, k1 and k2 are not geometrically isomorphic, then we are done. Then Rh gives uh, birch bombier OK, because uh, this estimate, the first part, so the C1 squared, C2 squared is an absolute bounded by an absolute constant. So this is exactly what I said. Now, uh, this can fail. So an obvious case where it's going to fail, if we think of this proportionality criterion, is uh, if A is equal to 1, B equal to 0, then this, of course, fails. And we want to show these are the only cases. So is that the only case? So in other words, we reduce to a, a priori uh, simple looking problem, concrete problem. Does there exist an alpha such that uh, KL3 of x is always, with modulus 1, alpha times Ep of minus Bx KL3 of AX. So it is not, I mean, it looks very concrete. This is something you can certainly check by computer for small primes that it's, it's unlikely to be true, but uh, it's not so obvious a priori how to prove that. So last time when we proved the kind of vile bound, qualitative form of vile bound, uh, we used the fact that the uh, the sum of the clue sum and sum was zero at a point where uh, the other sum which was constant one was not. Here there's no, I mean the obvious point where things are strange is zero, but it's the same on both sides. Um, you can try and take the modulus. Of course, KL3 of xp should not have the same modulus as KL3 of axp if a is not one, but how do you actually prove that? It's not so simple. Uh, so it's not entirely clear. So I think you can probably extract some kind of proof by, by some means, but I want to use this as a pretext uh, to introduce more of the underlying data to see what can be done. So there are actually different ways of doing this. There's one which starts with a little trick, uh, which I think is also good to see. There's nothing that says that we cannot try to use analytic techniques to study this sum. And uh, if you actually use a little bit of uh, analysis, so you can try and do uh, Fourier transform apply Plancherel, or you can just expand the custom and sums and be a little bit more careful than writing it as a five variable sum. And if you do this, you will reduce to a three variable character sum by using orthogonality. So expanding KL3s, applying orthogonality and regrouping in some ways. You obtain a different formula, which is actually the way it's written explicitly in the, uh, at least in the appendix of Birch and Bombieri. So they actually write it in this way. So you sum over T. And you have now a, a two variable character x custom and sum at one over t, 
and a KL2 at A over T plus P. So I don't put the P, it's uh, implicit. And here you have to think that uh, T is non-zero and not equal to minus B to not have uh, infinity. Or you can simply sum over FP, the same thing, and just use the, fa the definition that KL2 at infinity is equal to zero. And actually, this is a reasonable thing to do, uh, as we'll see. So what we have gained here is, so for, for Birch and Bombieri, this was important because now if you expand, it's a three variable character sum. So they actually succeeded in uh, applying Dolin's work for higher dimensional sums to estimate it and get code cancellation. Uh, you can also use this form to get a quicker approach to this black box version of the Riemann hypothesis. The point being that here, so kind of a special point which is t equals zero, but it corresponds to t equals minus b on this side. So you kind of immediately guess that uh, if, t, if b is not zero, this will have code cancellation. OK, so uh, applying our h to, so now we do another change of variable, which is again permitted by the formalism that I recall, which again, because it's just a bijection, uh, at least of the uh, projective line is always bounded complexity. KL2 of A over T plus B. Uh, is also bounded. So we see that, uh, so K1 tilde, K2 tilde are geometrically reducible, for instance, by the Diophantine criterion. And uh, K1 tilde is not proportional to K2 tilde, at least if uh, B is non-zero. Because the value, so values at t equals zero do not coincide. So one value at t equals zero is zero, and the other not. So at least it's not, uh, so this is KL2 of A over B. And so when P varies, there's no reason for KL2 of A over B to always be 0. Actually, if you think about it, it's not obvious. You need to actually prove something. So I should say probably not. So that's the point is that, I mean, this only is very suggestive. But because we don't have as simple cases as like the veil case where everything is of modulus either 1 or 0, uh, it's easy to see that the KL2 should not be always 0 at A over B, but uh, actually proving it might require some uh, argument. So actually proving that Klusterman sums are non-zero because it's a KL2 you can do by hand. Uh, but in more complicated cases, this type of trying to use just proportionality will give you completely O plus type of very concrete looking, very obvious looking question, but not uh, situations where you can do something. So we need a little bit of uh, extra formalism uh, to handle that case. So I will now go into this direction, but I would like to first uh, 
application. So I wanted to present another application where just the black box version is enough, but I don't think I will have time, so I'll, I'll do that later next week if I, if I have the opportunity. So we need some more formalism. And then we'll come back to this exponential sum estimate. And there will always re remain the case where b is 0, but we have to prove that when a is not 1, it's not proportional. That's also not obvious. OK, so, so formalism. So we already saw some of it come in naturally in, uh, in defining even these very special cases. So one was something that uh, was mentioned already. It's the decomposition in geometrically reducible pieces. So to be precise, this does not quite work uh, in the generality I'm going to state. There's a slight technical issue between representations, which could be reducible as representations of the group I called pi 1, whereas geometrically reducibility is a reducibility as representation of a slightly smaller subgroup. So there could be a discrepancy. It's not hard to deal with. It's just a bit technical. So I'm going to state something that's a little bit false, uh, but in papers you can see the, the actual version stated correctly. So any k, which is a trace function, can be written as a sum of at most the complexity of k geometrically reducible uh, sum and ki with complexity of ki at most the complexity of k. So if I don't put geometrically reducible, this would be literally correct. But geometric reducibility is what you need to have this form of the Riemann hypothesis. So this is a technical issue, which in applications has never uh, actually come up concretely. So it, it's, it's worth not trying to think about it too much at the moment. Uh, so elementary, more elementary things. So if you have representations, if you have two of them, you can build a direct sum. That's the most obvious way of constructing new representations out of old ones. And the corresponding operation is just the sum of the trace functions. So the sum of two trace functions is a trace function. So typically, if v1 and v2 are not 0, then this can never be geometrically reducible. It will have pieces which are invariant. Uh, and of course, in any of such operations, Kind of the first thing is to know that you can do the operational trace function, but you should always immediately then think, how does the complexity change? Without control of the complexity, these operations are uh, useless for applications. And what happens is, in that case, it's very simple. Whatever is the definition, the complexity of k1 plus k2 is basically the sum of the complexities of the sum end. Uh, so very easy operation also is, uh, so there's a twisting operation which on V uh, would be denoted by alpha uh, power deg tensor V where alpha is modulus 1. So whatever that is, this is an operation which maps uh, K to an alpha K. This, because alpha is modulus 1, it sends geometrically reducible to geometrically reducible and the complexity doesn't change. Then uh, if you go to the dual representation, then one shows that the corresponding operation is just complex conjugation. This is actually quite deep uh, at the missing points to check that the complex conjugate is the right thing is a, a, a deep fact due to offer Gaber. But this works, and the complexity doesn't change. And I should say that one could work without the missing points and just add them afterwards. So the, this, the fact that it's a deep fact is very convenient, that one doesn't have to make changes when taking conjugates, but it would not be a, a massive problem. It was, was not the case. Okay. 
change a variable. So suppose you have a gamma in PGL2 of FP, which acts on P1 uh, of FP, let's say, of FP bar, then uh, K of gamma X is a trace function. So this uses the fact that, so there is a natural extension of the trace function on FP to P1 of FP. So one can always speak for any given trace function of what is K of infinity in a completely canonical way. So the same way that here I said that KL2 of uh, infinity is zero, this is not just a convention, this is the right value. In other cases, it might be something else. So natural extension of K to define K of infinity. Uh, and the complexity of K of gamma X is the same as the complexity of K. So in particular, K of AX plus B for any fixed A and B with A non-zero is also a trace function. One can actually do other operations. You can also change variables by a polynomial and not just by uh, homography, but for the moment I won't go into this. Uh, with this, yes. Yeah. And you can prove it with the Diophantine criterion. When you change this variable, the sum is basically the same, except you might have switched infinity and the pre-image of infinity. So the sum has changed by a bounded amount between the two. And it's also completely obvious once one knows the in the formalism, it's just, a, I guess, precomposition by a homomorphism of the group, automorphism of the group. So I should say, uh, here also it preserves irreducibility. So this, so when I put a star, this means it preserves irreducibility. And it also preserves non-geometric irreducibility, if you want to think about it. OK, now something that's just a little tiny bit more complicated. Uh, I guess it's six, yeah? So what about products? So products is a bit more complicated because, so of course, what you want to do is if you have two representations to map it to the tensor product, so the characters should multiply. Uh, however, just like the product of two Dirichlet characters which are primitive might not be primitive, think of Legend times Legend is the trivial character. Uh, so here you get something which should be K1, K2, but is not quite. So So this is again a technical issue which has to do with the choice of formalism. So either you want to have analogs of Dirichlet characters or analogs of primitive Dirichlet characters. Both have their advantages. I prefer the primitive ones and so I have to change a little bit sometimes the product. So there exists a set S uh, in FP of size bounded by the sum of the complexities of the two terms in the product uh, such that and, and the case three trace function such that uh, k3 of x is k1, k2 outside of this bounded set. And uh, well, the complexity of k3 is bounded. Uh, I have to remember something like, OK, let me write 10 c1 squared c2 squared. Don't remember if it's correct, but it's almost certainly. So it's only bounded in terms of complexity of k1 and k2. And uh, because k3 is bounded by this quantity, L infinity norm is bounded by this quantity, k1 times k2 is bounded by c1 times c2, because L infinity norm is bounded by complexity. At these boundedly many points where the two functions don't coincide, the difference is also bounded. So for x, in S, K3 of X minus K1 of X, K2 of X, 
will be bounded by 1 depending on C1 and C2. So you can write down the inequalities that come out. It's not very important. So for all purposes, that means that the fact that it's not quite trace function is just a technical nuisance, just like taking products of Dirichlet characters, which is not always primitive. OK. Right. Now, something which is not quite formalism, which goes a little bit deeper in explaining what is the complexity, it's the issue of ramification points. So a Dirichlet character as a conductor, and I, I said the complexity is an IT conductor, but it also has some features uh, similar to the fact that the primes dividing a conductor in, for a Dirichlet character is places where something strange is happening. And here we have something similar. So one uh, defines a finite subset. OK, so this is an invariant, I should say, of really of the representation. So I should say we start with the row. So given a representation rho, uh, there is a finite subset of so-called uh, ramification points. I will uh, call it S rho, singularities. Uh, this is most naturally seen as a subset of P1 of FQ bar. So it's either uh, of FP bar, sorry. So it's not necessarily an element of FP. Could be something which lies in a, a, a extension, or it could be infinity, uh, such that, um, so how did I, right. Uh, one way of phrasing it is this way. So uh, first, the size of S rho is again bounded by the complexity. So that's the second ingredient in the complexity. So there's the L infinity norm, or if you want, the dimension of V. And there is this set of singular points. And if the sum of these two invariants was enough to bound the complexity, this would be great. So it turns out it's not the case, but we'll see that next week. And uh, what is the meaning of these singular points? Uh, so one way of saying this is that uh, for x, not a singular point, so unramified, uh, I'm going to phrase it this way. So k of x can be written as the trace of a unitary matrix of size dimension of e. So k is the trace function associated to. I guess I have to let this one go. So if x is unramified, so x is in fp, but not ramified, then k of x is the trace of a unitary matrix of size dimension of e. OK, so in particular, of course, this recovers the fact that the L infinity norm is bounded by the dimension which is bounded by the complexity, uh, at least for these unramified things. So it implies that the value of k of x has an equal dimension of v and equal to complexity. And so this would not be so useful, but if x is in S row, this fails more precisely. So uh, k of x is the trace of a matrix of strictly smaller size, so really strictly smaller, and whose eigenvalues are all of size at most 1 over square root of p. So the eigenvalues drop, actually. Uh, are all the eigenvalues? No, it's only not. Uh, so, so one of which, at least. Uh, so not one of which, so one eigenvalue of which. So drop in, in uh, modulus of the eigenvalues. 
uh, if you know a little bit about modular forms, this is very analog to the fact that at the ramified primes, the static parameters drop in modulus. So Ramajan Peterson conjecture says modulus is one at the for all the local parameters at unramified primes, and at the ramified primes, it is known that actually it drops in modulus. So this in this case, because it's not necessarily reducible, it could be that some eigenvalues remain of modulus one. But that's the main point is this. And from this or from other fact, uh, it's easy to check then that S rho is an invariant of rho up to geometric isomorphism. And therefore, this gives us a way sometimes to say that two things are not geometrically isomorphic simply because we know what is this finite set. And if the two sets are not the same, they are not geometrically isomorphic. So, so where does this dimension less in complexity come from? Uh, this is something I said. So, <laughs> so in the way we define the complexity, so we actually define the complexity as the sum of three terms, the dimension of the representation, the number of singular points, and an invariant of world ramification. Oh, so you, it's not just the analytic conductor. No. If you took just the analytic conductor, what problems would you have? So if you just take the analytic conductor, then it would not be a height. In, in what, uh, like which thing? So typically, for example, all hypergeometric sheaves in the sense of cats would have the same conductor. And some of these have unbounded rank and so on. So you, I mean, the, well, it depends what you mean by analytic conductor. So it's not the Artin conductor, for instance. One needs a little bit more information. Yeah, so I come to some and some, they have uh, rates at one over, uh, one over the index of the closed sum. So yeah, less than five. So they have unbounded ranking. Yes. Yeah. So, but actually, so we've been told by Will Sawin that, uh, so there's a better thing to take, which would be, uh, Actually, I'll state it later because I need something else. So there are more algebraic versions of the definition of the conductor, but I mean we cannot just rewrite all our papers for the moment. So we're keeping the old one up, up, up until the point where it's really not possible to ignore a better definition. I mean, for writing number theory, this is not this is not the issue. So okay, so to remain, remember to recall. Uh, Repeat a little bit. So we have one extra invariant, this set of singular points. So let's go through the examples and say what we can say about these singular points. Uh, case one, so for additive characters, this is included. So there could be some issues for small prime, but it's included in the set of uh, poles of F uh, for E p of f of n uh, for multiplicative characters, it's zeros or poles of f, and one can be more precise and say exactly which ones are, which ones are not. So to see an example where it's not equality here, if you have a double pole and a character of order two, so double pole means you have a factor, let's say one over x minus alpha squared, and this is not ramified for the quadratic character. So, so if you, you can be more precise, but it's enough for the moment. Uh, for two, for Klusterman sums, it's zero and infinity. And for, uh, for uh, the case three, k of n, okay, so for counting function of number of solutions, uh, again, I think there might be some things happening which I don't remember exactly, but it's only included in the set of critical values of f. So critical values means you look at the zeros of the derivative and the image of f under this. So this is a set of f of zeros of f prime. So when I say there could be issues, typically if the polynomial has degree divisible by p or something, you could expect strange things to happen, but one can be more precise. This is just to be... Uh, to begin with, and for the uh, uh, Legendre curve, so this k of n, which counts the number of points on the Legendre family of elliptic curves, this is 0, 1, infinity. So which uh, is, I mean, typically here you see this is the situation where things behave a little bit strangely. So here if you take n equals 0 or 1, you have a double, 
root and infinity seems to be always a little bit stranger. Uh, infinity is not always, so here I should, no, it's actually. So here if you have a rational function which is regular at infinity, uh, like 1 over x, then this is not a singularity of E of 1 over x, for instance. Okay. So with this done, we can go back slightly to what I, what we are trying to do with the Friedlander even yet sum once it's transformed into a, a sum of KL2s. So back to FI LBP. So this was the sum of after transformation T in FP KL2 of 1 over T, KL2 of A over T plus B. Okay? And now uh, we can use this extra information to see that if uh, B is non zero, then uh, K1, so this was, or K tilde 1, is ramified at um, zero but not k2, k tilde 2. So for t equals 0, it's like kl2 of infinity, and kl2 at infinity is ramified. This is example 2 above. And uh, for t equals 0, we have a over b, which in that case is just an element which is neither 0 nor infinity, so it is unramified. So they are not geometrically isomorphic. So there remains the case, uh, b is equal to 0 and a uh, different from 1, where we expect they are not geometrically, uh, geometrically isomorphic, but it's not obvious. In that case, both are ramified at 0 and infinity. Actually, I think in the paper they don't need that case. So if I remember right, for some reason I would have to check. I think it's enough for, for the friedlander ivanez argument to deal with the case where uh, b is non-zero. I don't know. I have to check that. Anyway, so next week we'll see further invariants which allow you to distinguish uh, KL2 of 1 over t with KL2 of A over t and show that when A is not 1, they are indeed not isomorphic. So this is still not clear with the uh, amount of information we have. Okay. Now in the last few minutes, I want to introduce one last piece of formalism, which is much deeper than what I've already described, and uh, indicate some other application, natural analytic application. So I guess it's number seven. Yeah. It's the Fourier transform. Now this is extremely deep, if only because there's no analog of this at all for uh, classical modular forms, or for modular forms of a number of fields. Uh, so this is an operation that makes sense over trace functions and which has an incarnation at the level of the underlying representations, but for which there are no analogs of a number field. So it's really a deep, uh, deep construction, which is again due to the Lean and uh, which was studied extensively by Lomont and by Katz and a few others. Okay, so here's the thing I want to say. So let K be a trace function. Yes? I think once you have eliminated, eliminated the case B uh, non-zero, you are done. Because then you change variable to T goes to 1 over T there. And then you can evaluate. Uh, ah, yes, that's the way to do it. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So in, you can check if B is actually zero. You can actually compute this by by Plancherel formula, essentially. Yes, thanks. Okay, so you, or maybe it's not zero, you cannot make the change over. Yeah, yeah. Over white, you. Yeah. So, so these two, I, when I, I mean, it will be clear. So this is the, if you replace T by one over T, this will be transform, Fourier transform of uh, characters 
one dimensional thing and you can ex ex execute this sum when, uh, when b is equal to zero. That's actually the way Freelander and Ivan needs to wait for in the paper. Okay, which again exemplifies the fact that one should not just blindly try to apply the formalism. I mean, your analytic instincts and your analytic knowledge can always or often still be used even in situations where algebraically it looks a bit iffy and, and not obvious. So one can also prove it algebraically, of course, but uh, one requires then a little bit more work. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let k be a trace function mod p. We need an assumption. We need that uh, either it's geometrically reducible and not a uh, additive character, or I could say that with no uh, uh, factor, so when I mean factor, I mean sum end of the type uh, alpha times EP of AX over P in its decomposition. So if K is geometrically reducible, that just means that K is not proportional to this or it's not geometrically isomorphic to uh, So probably speaking, this has to be a statement at the level of the underlying representation. But for small complexity, it's the same as saying that if you decompose it as a sum of trace functions, which are geometrically reducible, there's none which is just proportional to an additive character. And the reason we need this is simply that the Fourier transform of an additive character is a delta function, and delta functions are not well uh, handled by the formalism I'm describing. So there's a, another formalism which can do it, but it's even more abstract, and I don't want to go into this. Okay, so for instance, uh, any of the examples we've seen has this property, uh, including case three, which is not entirely obvious, but it is if the degree of f is less than p, provided f in that case is not of degree one. So all the examples here work except this when f is of degree one, or uh, sometimes this when the degree of f is larger than p, larger or equal to p. So it's a very generic assumption. So then I define the Fourier transform of k as the map, the function on fp, which sends h to, so we normalize by one over square root of p, it's the most natural in this case. So I think at first we were using just the naive sum and then Paul Nelson pointed out that <laughs> it was much better to be unitary in this case. Uh, so it's just the usual uh, Fourier transform. We've taken the bad habit of writing E of an over P instead of minus an over P. That, that, that's from Katz because that's what he uses in his books. Hmm? That's an H, yes, thank you. And there's an H here. Yeah, HN over P. So it's just a discrete Fourier transform with this normalization. So the meaning of the normalization is that when there's code cancellation, this will be bounded. So it has a chance of being a trace function of something with bounded complexity, and this is what happens. So there's a CRM. It's really deep. It also uses the Riemann hypothesis in a fairly strong form. So if, uh, so, so there exists a representation ft of rho, such that the trace function is exactly that, including all the bad primes. There's no, no change has to be made. So this is the lean, uh, minor addition an epsilon-esque addition that was not in the literature but was not particularly hard to check uh, based on the work of Lomont in particular is that, uh, as I said, this would be nice theoretically but not very useful for anything number theory unless we control the complexity. And from the work of Lomont, uh, which says lots about the invariance of the free transform, it's not hard to check then that the uh, complexity is controlled and what we got was 10 uh, complexity of k squared, which is probably not best possible, but certainly is enough for applications. Okay, so that's a. Uh, you don't want to be pedantic and put a minus one. 
No, I don't want to be pedantic because I didn't do it for the clue standard sum. So, <laughs> yeah, the most I mean, the most proper way of defining this would have a minus sign. Okay. Uh, so examples. Uh, well, why is that? Well, it's an H1. It's a trace on H1. And it has to be an alternating sum. Yeah, I know, I, I've not mentioned the word cohomology a single time, except like two seconds ago. OK, oops, I'm already over time. Uh, do I want to say anything that's? Right, let me state a, an immediate corollary of this, uh, which actually, in principle, goes back to more or less the thesis of Philippe is that you can have a polyavinograd of bounds for any trace function. So let k satisfying so a trace function which has a Fourier transform as in the sense above also uh, i modulo p is any interval so meaning the projection modulo p of an interval of integers of length strictly less than or equal to p then uh, what you deduce from this in the standard completion method that was explained by Terry, for instance, is that uh, you get, uh, well, the conductor of the Fourier transform, so C will be the complexity of K, so 10 C squared, uh, square root of P, and log of 3 times P. We actually had a paper where there was a big O symbol, and then Serre sent us the remark that you could replace the big O symbol by less than or equal to log of 3p. So we had less less than log p, but it doesn't like implicit constants. Uh, OK, so and this is completely straightforward. You just apply, you write this as, you apply Planck-Schell formula. So this will be the sum of the Fourier transform of the interval, characteristic function interval, times Fourier transform of k. You bound the Fourier transform of k by its L infinity norm, which is bounded by the complexity, which is at most 10 c squared. And then you sum the Fourier transform of the interval, which is without normalization, at most square root of p times log of 3 times p. Uh, and that's the proof. OK, so I'll uh, stop here for today. Uh, any questions? Come on. Can you say something about the irreducibility of the Fourier transform? Oh, yes. So it's, uh, in this case, it's completely obvious from the Diophantine criterion. Fourier tr transform, the way I define it, is unitary. And therefore, the, uh, the L2 quantity that you want to control is the same. So if k is geometrically reducible, so is the Fourier transform. And of course, it can also be proved differently. But from the analytic point of view, there's no mystery in this fact. It's a very useful fact, because the Fourier transform uh, of something of rank one can be quite complicated, can have arbitrary rank. Uh, if you have an arbitrary rank object, it's sometimes hard to check that it's irreducible, but if, the, if it's Fourier transform of rank one, it's obvious. On this side. Yeah. So, so in the example three, is it a theorem that if you have a non-singular critical value, then, then it is included in S row? Um, Yes, yeah, only at least if the degree is co-prime with p. If the degree of f is less than p, let's say, strictly less than p, yeah, that's only the case. OK, so if there is no more questions. <laughs>